Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Timeless Testimonies. Today we're going to be looking at the last section of the testimony for the church called The Nature and Influence of the Testimonies from Volume 5. The beginning of this section, um, The Nature and Influence of the Testimonies, begins on page 653, and the part that we're going to be looking at today begins on page 683. So it's, we've been going through a lot here. And I want to remind us, since this is the last video of this testimony, I want to remind us why we're going through this testimony in Volume 5. And the best way I know how to do that is just to review the very opening statement from the testimony. So here's what Ellen White says. As the end draws near and the work of giving the last warning to the world extends, it becomes more important for those who accept present truth to have a clear understanding of the nature and influence of the testimonies, which God in his providence has linked with the work of the third angel's message from its very rise. In the following pages are given extracts from what I've written during the last 40 years relating to my own early experience in this special work and also presenting what God has shown me concerning the nature and importance of the testimonies, the manner in which they are given, and how they should be regarded. Okay, so we've gone over a lot of these portions. You know, we've, we've touched on these things, like, you know, how important they are, how they've been given, and we've even gotten into portions going over how they should be regarded. And our last couple of videos were very specific on that point. This is continuing on into um, that whole theme of things. So let's go ahead and get back into it now on page 683 and see what she has to say concerning an unwarranted distinction. Some have taken the position that warnings, cautions, and reproofs given by the Lord through his servant unless they come through special vision for each individual case, should have no more weight than counsels and warnings from other sources. In some cases, it has been represented that in giving a testimony for churches or individuals, I have been influenced to write as I did by letters received from members of the church. There have been those who claimed that testimonies purporting to be given by the Spirit of God were merely the expression of my own judgment, based upon information gathered from human sources. This statement is utterly false. If, however, in response to some question, statement, or appeal from churches or individuals, a testimony is written presenting the light which God has given concerning them, the fact that it has been called forth in this manner in no wise detracts from its validity or importance. I quote from Testimony 31 a few paragraphs bearing directly upon this point. Okay, so she's just setting up this section. She's introducing the purpose of writing this. And remember, these testimonies are written to um, Advent believers, people who profess belief in Ellen White's calling as a messenger for God and in her inspiration. How was it with the Apostle Paul? The news he received through the household of Chloe concerning the condition of the church at Corinth was what caused him to write his first epistle to that church. Private letters had come to him stating the facts as they existed, and in his answer he laid down general principles which, if heeded, would correct the existing evils. With great tenderness and wisdom he exhorts them to all speak the same things, that there be no divisions among them. Paul was an inspired apostle, yet the Lord did not reveal to him at all times just the condition of his people. Those who were interested in the prosperity of the church and saw evils creeping in presented the matter before him, and from the light which he had previously received, 
he was prepared to judge of the true character of these developments. Because the Lord had not given him a new revelation for that special time, those who were really seeking light did not cast his message aside as only a common letter. No, indeed. The Lord had shown him the difficulties and dangers which would arise in the churches, that when they should develop, he might know just how to treat them. He was set for the defense of the church. He was to watch for souls as one that must render account to God. And should he not take notice of the reports concerning their state of anarchy and division? Most assuredly. And the reproof he sent them was written just as much under the inspiration of the Spirit of God as were any of his epistles. But when these reproofs came, some would not be corrected. They took the position that God had not spoken to them through Paul, that he had merely given them his opinion as a man, and they regarded their own judgment as good as that of Paul. So it is with many among our people who have drifted away from the old landmarks and who have followed their own understanding. That was taken from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 65 and 66. So let's just examine that a little bit and just kind of, you know, reiterate what she's saying. It really helps to let it sink in. What's being said here? She's bringing to our attention the fact that, hey, she's been accused of um, just giving her own opinion if she provides counsel, reproof, or warning without some amazing, miraculous vision. But here we have, in the New Testament, letters written by Paul, who uh, was clearly an inspired messenger. And what was the situation with Paul? He was responding to issues within the church based on letters that he received from individuals in those churches bringing out the problems that were happening that weren't able to be resolved. And she's just saying here how, you know, he was prepared for that prior to it happening because God was teaching him the general principles. And so he was set to watch to see any dangers or problems that were creeping into the church, and he would know how to deal with them when they came up. And she's saying, she's comparing, say, look, if you recognize that Paul was an inspired messenger and yet God didn't always do something miraculous to make him aware of how to counsel and reprove people or to correct wrongs taking place, use just balances, equal weights and measures, and justly judge this situation as well and realize that it's the principles that govern uh, truth, that govern our actions and how we should respond to things. And it's not necessary for God to give a vision for every individual case. That's why understanding heavenly principles is so wonderful, so amazing, because so long as we understand the principles of truth, we then are equipped to face any situation. If we really understand the principles of truth, we will respond appropriately if we're corrected by God through an inspired messenger or even through any other means. The truth is the truth regardless of who brings it but especially an inspired messenger, one that we've tested. We have evidence to show that they are an inspired messenger. Then to try to take the position that what they say is only under inspiration so long as they've had some vision doesn't really make any sense because we have multiple examples of how God uses messengers and many times, in fact, probably the majority of the examples that I'm aware of in scripture 
are not of a visionary experience by a messenger. They're based on being taught the principles of truth to begin with. So that's basically just going back over what she said here. Um, but I thought that it was such an important key factor that, you know, if we don't understand that, continuing on with the rest of the testimony, we'll miss out on some of the benefit. But now that we've reviewed it again, let's continue on to the next part. When this position is taken by our people, then the special warnings and counsels of God through the spirit of prophecy can have no influence with them to work a reformation in life and character. The Lord does not give a vision to meet each emergency which may arise in the different attitudes of his people in the development of his work. But he has shown me that it has been his way of dealing with his church in past ages to impress the minds of his chosen servants with the needs and dangers of his cause and of individuals, and to lay upon them the burden of counsel and warning. So in many cases, God has given me light in regard to peculiar defects of character in members of the church and the dangers to the individual and the cause if these defects are not removed. Under certain circumstances, wrong tendencies are liable to become strongly developed and confirmed and to work injury to the cause of God and ruin to the individual. Sometimes, when special dangers threaten the cause of God or particular individuals, a communication comes to me from the Lord, either in a dream or a vision of the night, and these cases are brought vividly to my mind. I hear a voice saying to me, Arise and write, these souls are in peril. I obey the movings of the Spirit of God, and my pen traces their true condition. As I travel and stand before the people in different places, the Spirit of the Lord brings before me clearly the cases I have been shown, reviving the matter previously given me. For the last 45 years, the Lord has been revealing to me the needs of his cause and the cases of individuals in every phase of experience, showing where and how they have failed to perfect Christian character. The history of hundreds of cases has been presented to me, and that which God approves and that which he condemns has been plainly set before me. God has shown me that a certain course, if followed, or certain traits of character, if indulged, would produce certain results. He has thus been training and disciplining me in order that I might see the dangers which threaten souls, and instruct and warn his people, line upon line, precept upon precept, that they might not be ignorant of Satan's devices and might escape his snares. The work which the Lord has laid out before me especially is to urge young and old, learned and unlearned, to search the scriptures for themselves, to impress upon all that the study of God's word will expand the mind and strengthen every faculty fitting the intellect to wrestle with problems of truth, deep and far-reaching, to assure all that the clear knowledge of the Bible outdoes all other knowledge in making man what God designed he should be. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. With the light communicated through the study of his word, with the special knowledge given of individual cases among his people under all circumstances and in every phase of experience, can I now be in the same ignorance, the same mental uncertainty and spiritual blindness as at the beginning of this experience? Will my brethren say that Sister White has been so dull a scholar that her judgment in this direction is no better than before she entered Christ's school to be trained and disciplined for a special work? 
Am I no more intelligent in regard to the duties and perils of God's people than are those before whom these things have never been presented? I would not dishonor my Maker by admitting that all this light, all the display of His mighty power in my work and experience has been valueless, that it has not educated my judgment or better fitted me for His work. When I see men and women taking the very course or cherishing the very traits which have imperiled other souls and wounded the cause of God, and which the Lord has reproved again and again, how can I but be alarmed? When I see timid souls burdened with a sense of their imperfections, yet conscientiously striving to do what God has said is right, and know that the Lord looks down and smiles on their faithful efforts, shall I not speak a word of encouragement to these poor, trembling hearts? Shall I hold my peace because each individual case has not been pointed out to me in direct vision? I hope you can see the reasonableness of this argument. You know, she's just pointing out the very simplistic truth of the matter, that there are many cases over the years, you know, by this point, it had been 45 years that she has been instructed by God, that she has been taught the principles of truth, and that she has had to correct other people for doing certain things. And you learn along the way, you recognize, okay, this is the same thing in principle. And there were cases that were even specifically shown to her in vision. So along the way, she's learning all these principles, and it's not necessary to have a vision for every individual case. And I think everyone here can understand that that is completely reasonable. Quoting, but if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. End of quote. In a recent dream, I was brought before an assembly of people, some of whom were making efforts to remove the impression of a most solemn testimony of warning that I had given them. They said, We believe Sister White's testimonies, but when she tells us things that she has not directly seen in vision in the particular case under consideration, her words are of no more account to us than the words of any other person. The Spirit of the Lord came upon me, and I arose and rebuked them in the name of the Lord. I repeated in substance that which I had presented above in regard to the watchman. This, I said, is appropriate to your case and to mine. As I read this and I think about my own situation and I think, okay, well, man, I, I'm learning to love correction. And I hope that the rest of us are too, that everyone here watching, if you've seen the rest of the videos and the nature and influence of the testimony, you know, we've talked about how uh, in Proverbs, especially, it talks about people who are foolish don't want to be corrected, but the wise love correction. And if you think about it, if you're corrected, it means that you've been redirected to a right course which means that you were on a wrong course. And if you're on a wrong course, wouldn't you want to know? 
I mean, put all pride and selfishness aside. Wouldn't you want to know if what you're doing is dangerous to yourself or to those whom you love? And while it does go against uh, the carnal mind, the sinful nature to be corrected and to be shown faults, if we can train ourselves to recognize that it's a good thing to be corrected, then we can defeat the lies of the enemy in trying to convince us that um, we've been wronged in some way by being corrected. I mean, just think about, really think about it, how absurd to think that we've been wronged when we've been redirected from a wrong course to a right course. So if we can view correction properly, then we won't take offense, we won't be hurt, we won't be offended, pride won't rise up, right? Um, we'll see, oh man, that was a close one, you know? I was on a self-destructive course and this person cares enough about me to try to redirect me. So if we can really get in the habit of trying to view things from the other person's perspective and to you know put ourselves in their situation and say, okay, if I had to correct someone, how would I feel? Well, I'd probably feel kind of uncomfortable you know, I, I might not feel real uh, safe in, in bringing something up to someone, and I might not be uh, real um, comfortable with how the person is going to respond, and are they going to be upset with me, and you know. So you have to, the person correcting has to be willing to put their own emotions and their own feelings aside as well because it's not a pleasant thing to have to correct someone that you love if you can see the potential for it to tempt them to not view things rightly. Um, if you know that a person loves correction, then it wouldn't be as hard, right? Because you would know that you're just helping them anyway, and you would know that they're going to be happy about it. So if we can all just learn to love correction, we're going to make life easy for all of us, right? We'll be happy because we've been corrected. The person needing to correct won't be feeling, you know, any kind of stress or anxiety about, ah, how's this person going to respond? And it'll just be us working together, helping one another, um, lifting each other up out of these pits and, and helping to dispel the lies and the deception that the enemy tries to cloud our understanding and our reasoning capabilities with. So anyway, I don't want to go on too long, but I just thought that was important to bring out. But we'll continue on here. Now, if those to whom these solemn warnings are addressed say... It is only Sister White's individual opinion. I shall still follow my own judgment. And if they continue to do the very things they were warned not to do, they show that they despise the counsel of God, and the result is just what the Spirit of God has shown me it would be, injury to the cause of God and ruin to themselves. Some who wish to strengthen their own position will bring forward from the testimony statements which they think will support their views and will put the strongest possible construction upon them. But that which questions their course of action or which does not coincide with their views, they pronounce Sister White's opinion, denying its heavenly origin and placing it on a level with their own judgment. So again, an opportunity for us to self-examine do we take portions of the testimonies that agree with our opinion and really support, you know, hammer them home and use them as weighty evidence to support our view or our stance? 
And then some of the other things that are in the testimonies that don't agree with our view or our opinion, do we then say, well, that's, that doesn't hold the same weight. Have we done that? If we have, is that justified? Is there any real justification for taking that um, position? Opportunity to, to really examine that. And if we can um, honestly see that, you know what? No, there isn't any justified reason for doing that. What a blessing. Our eyes have been opened and we can make the choice right then to decide to not do that anymore and to start looking at all of the portions of the testimonies and seeing how they apply. If they apply and how they apply to our individual cases and then training ourselves to love correction. You know what? If you've never tried that, why not give it a try? Why not take the opportunity to do something different from what you've done in the past, really apply the testimonies to your own life, make changes, and see what the result is. See how much joy and peace and harmony can be brought about by practicing principles of truth and righteousness. So we'll continue on here. If you, my brethren, who have been acquainted with me and my work for many years, take the position that my counsel is of no more value than the counsel of those who have not been specially educated for this work, then do not ask me to unite with you in labor. For while you occupy this position, you will inevitably counteract the influence of my work. If you feel just as safe in following your own impulses as in following the light given by God's delegated servant, the peril is your own. You will be condemned because you rejected the light which heaven had sent you. I, I like that. She's showing that all of this comes from heaven. And she is making the claim that she is God's delegated servant. She also expected people to test uh, whether or not she was a messenger. In the rest of uh, the videos prior to this, in this section, the influence and testimonies, sorry, the nature and influence of the testimonies, she points out that they can be judged by the fruits, that we should test whether or not the testimonies are inspired. And after we've tested, based upon the evidence, then we can know whether they are or not. She's like, hey, it's either inspired by God or inspired by Satan. It's not a combination. It's not a little bit inspired by God and then the rest isn't. It's one or the other. So figure out which one it is. Figure out which one it is and then either accept it or reject it. There's only two ways. Light or darkness. Truth or falsehood. Right? There is no middle ground. Something is either true or it isn't. Okay, so we'll continue here. While at blank, the Lord came to me in the night season and spoke precious words of encouragement concerning my work, repeating the same message that had been given me several times before. With regard to those who have turned from the light sent them, he said, in sliding and rejecting the testimony that I had given you to bear, it is not you, but me, your Lord, that they have slided. If those who are headstrong and full of self-esteem go on unchecked in their course, what will be the condition of things in the church? How are the wrongs to be corrected which exist in these strong-willed, ambitious ones? By what means will God reach them? How will he set his church in order? Differences of opinion are constantly arising, and apostasies often afflict the church. When controversy or division comes in, 
all parties claim to be right and to have a conscience void of offense. And they will not be instructed by those who have long borne the burden of the work and who they have reason to know have been guided by the Lord. Want to pause there? That's very, very important. If you didn't catch it, let me read it again. When controversy or division comes in, all parties claim to be right and to have a conscience void of offense, and they will not be instructed by those who have long borne the burden of the work and who they have reason to know have been guided by the Lord. So they've tested it. They've been given evidence, reason to know. It's not just a belief. It's not an uncertainty. It's true knowledge based upon reason. They have reason to know that this person or persons or, you know, whatever the case may be, has been in, guided by the Lord. So again, I want to point out that she's not expecting or um, trying to uh, encourage people to just accept blindly without evidence what she's saying or any point of truth. We shouldn't just believe something. We need to know the truth. And the only way we can know something is by evidence, by reason. Okay, so I'll continue on here. Light has been sent to dispel their darkness but they are too proud of heart to accept it, and they choose the darkness. They despise the counsel of God because it does not coincide with their views and plans and favor their wrong traits of character. The work of the Spirit of God, which would bring them into the right position if they would accept it, has not come in a way to please them and to flatter their self-righteousness. The light which God has given is no light to them, and they wander in darkness. They claim that no more confidence is to be placed in the judgment of one who has had such a long experience and whom the Lord has taught and used to do a special work than in that of any other person. Is it God's plan that they should do thus? Or is it the special working of the enemy of all righteousness to hold souls in error, to bind them in strong delusions that cannot be broken, because they have placed themselves beyond the reach of means that God has ordained to deal with his church? The reproofs, the cautions, the corrections of the Lord have been given to his church in all ages of the world. These warnings were despised and rejected in Christ's day by the self-righteous Pharisees who claimed that they needed no such reproof and were unjustly dealt with. They would not receive the word of the Lord through his servants because it did not please their inclinations. So just because something doesn't please our inclinations, just because something kind of strikes at our pride, we'd have to admit that we were wrong. That doesn't mean that that's the best course to take. And it's easy for us after the fact to look back on like the Pharisees for the example that she uses and to see how, yeah, they very clearly were not behaving in a loving way. We can see that's pretty obvious. And we can see that they rose up against him because he was correcting their wrongs. So if we can just stop and pause and say, okay, is this what's happening? Like if, if somebody's correcting us or we read a testimony or something that's uh, been written under inspiration for our situation or even spoken or whatever, but if, if we receive a reproof or we read something that we can apply to ourselves, 
and we find kind of we're not happy about it, that's really the time when we should ask ourselves, why am I not happy about this? And just get to the bottom of whether it's true or not. If it's true, if the reproof is true, even though we might not, you know, want to admit it or like the feeling that we have to admit that we're wrong, we may have to really humble ourselves. But it'll be so much better because we want the truth, or at least we should. So back to what she's saying here about the uh, Pharisees. Should the Lord give a vision right before this class of people in our day, pointing out their mistakes, rebuking their self-righteousness, and condemning their sins, they would rise up in rebellion, like the inhabitants of Nazareth, when Christ showed them their true condition. If these persons do not humble their hearts before God, if they harbor the suggestions of Satan, doubt and infidelity will take possession of the soul, and they will see everything in a false light. Let the seeds of doubt once be sown in their hearts, and they will have an abundant harvest to reap. They will come to mistrust and disbelieve truths which are plain and full of beauty to others who have not educated themselves in unbelief. Those who train the mind to seize upon everything which they can use as a peg to hang a doubt upon and suggest these thoughts to other minds will always find occasion to doubt. They will question and criticize everything that arises in the unfolding of truth. Criticize the work and position of others. Criticize every branch of the work in which they have not themselves a part. They will feed upon the errors and mistakes and faults of others until, said the angel, the Lord Jesus shall rise up from his mediatorial work in the heavenly sanctuary and shall clothe himself with the garments of vengeance and surprise them at their unholy feast. And they will find themselves unprepared for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Their taste has been so perverted that they would be inclined to criticize even the table of the Lord in his kingdom. Now, I want to pause there for a second. That's a really interesting statement. You know, we could take that strictly as referring to food, like, oh, you're not eating the right food. But do you think that's really the point of this statement? Food in scripture symbolizes truth or doctrine. And when we sit at a, a table, a spiritual feast, so to speak, then we're talking about spiritual truths. We're talking about the Word of God. And in the context that she's making this statement, she's talking about people criticizing the work of God, criticizing the people who are involved in the work that they're not involved in, and um, training their minds to doubt. And so then she says, their taste has been so perverted that they would be inclined to criticize even the table of the Lord in his kingdom. Now, I can definitely see that referring to criticizing the truths that Christ brings out. And doesn't that happen? I mean, look at, well, look at history, first of all, and you see how with each progression of truth and understanding, with each new message brought to God's people, people who uh, weren't following principles of truth did criticize the table of the Lord. And man, let's not be among those people. Let's seek the truth for the sake of the truth and be willing to follow it wherever it leads because the truth is all that matters and to not be closed to um, the food that Jesus presents at his table. 
Has God ever revealed to these self-deceived ones that no reproofs or corrections from him are to have any weight with them unless they come through direct vision? Good question. Has God ever said that? I don't know of anywhere. I dwell upon this point because the position that many are now taking upon it is a delusion of Satan to ruin souls. When he has ensnared and weakened them through his sophistry, so that when they are reproved, they persist in making of none effect the workings of God's Spirit, his triumph over them will be complete. Some who profess righteousness will, like Judas, betray their Lord into the hands of his bitterest enemies. These self-confident ones, okay, I'm going to pause right there. I'm not even going to finish the sentence for a second because I think this is really important to contemplate, to consider. Some who profess righteousness, okay, so they're not professing wickedness. They're professing righteousness. Some will, like Judas, betray their Lord into the hands of his bitterest enemies, these self-confident ones. Okay, so she's showing how this class of people who profess righteousness but end up betraying their Lord are self-confident. Let's not be self-confident. Let's not be puffed up with pride. Let us be humble like Jesus was and follow his example and be teachable, be meek, and to not be just so certain of ourselves, so certain that we're right. It'll make it a lot easier to be corrected to, you know, when we don't take that hard, firm stance. Now, I know what I'm talking about, right? I'm not wrong. There's no way I could be wrong. And then even if we are faced with unmistakable evidence to the contrary, the fact that we have taken such a firm stance that there's no way we could be wrong makes it that much harder to admit it when we are wrong. And many times we may not admit it, sadly. So to make it as easy on ourselves as possible to do the right to um, recognize correction as truth when it comes. Let's not be self-confident. Let's not set ourselves up to betray Christ. These self-confident ones, determined to have their own way and to advocate their own ideas, will go on from bad to worse until they will pursue any course rather than to give up their own will. They will go on blindly in the way of evil, but, like the deluded Pharisees, so self-deceived that they think they are doing God's service. What a sad state of deception to actually think that we're doing God's service when we're totally working contrary to his service. I cannot overemphasize the need for us to self-examine on these points. It is so vital, especially for those who believe present truth, to be in a constant state of self-examination and to be humble and willing to be corrected, to be willing to be taught, and to not be self-confident. Christ portrayed the Course which a certain class will take when they have a chance to develop their true character. Quote, And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. End quote. God has given me a marked, solemn experience in connection with his work, and you may be assured that so long as my life is spared, I shall not cease to lift a warning voice as I am impressed by the Spirit of God, whether men will hear or whether they will forbear. I have no special wisdom in myself. 
I am only an instrument in the Lord's hands to do the work He has set for me to do. The instructions that I have given by pen or voice have been an expression of the light that God has given me. I have tried to place before you the principles that the Spirit of God has for years been impressing upon my mind and writing on my heart. And now, brethren, I entreat you not to interpose between me and the people and turn away the light which God would have come to them. Do not, by your criticisms, take out all the force, all the point and power from the testimonies. Do not feel that you can dissect them to suit your own ideas, claiming that God has given you ability to discern what is light from heaven and what is the expression of mere human wisdom. If the testimonies speak not according to the word of God, reject them. Christ and Belial cannot be united. For Christ's sake, do not confuse the minds of the people with human sophistry and skepticism and make of none effect the work that the Lord would do. Do not, by your lack of spiritual discernment, make of this agency of God a rock of offense whereby many shall be caused to stumble and fall and be snared and be taken. So that's how she ends the testimony, with a plea to people to not hinder people from accepting the truth. You know, if you think that your wisdom is above all others' wisdom, and you think that you have the ability to discern, you know, what's divinely inspired and what's not divinely inspired. That's not even a valid position to take in this situation. That's what she's bringing out. She's like, look, if the testimonies speak not according to the word of God, reject them. Don't take parts of them and say, yeah, this is inspired, but this isn't. Because Christ and Belial cannot be united. Take the time to test the spirits. Test the testimonies for the church. Test to see, was Ellen White a true messenger? If anyone else comes in the name of the Lord claiming to bear a message, test their message. It's either from the Lord or it's not. It can't be a little bit from the Lord and a little bit not from the Lord. If someone is claiming to have a message from the Lord, it either is or it isn't. It's either from the Lord or it's from the devil. So don't take the position that you have wisdom to discern if there's a little bit of truth in something and promote that and then promote disbelief in other aspects of the testimonies because it's a false premise to begin with. I hope and pray that these testimonies and the videos on the testimonies have really been a blessing and I look forward to getting into some of the other subjects that we'll be going to next. Uh, we may revisit some other testimonies that deal with the principles of, um, of what we've been going through for so long, the nature and influence of the testimonies. but. Now that we've laid the foundation for how they should be regarded, what position we should take toward them, and what they're really claiming, you know, are they claiming to be uh, inspired or not? And yes, they are. So we have to test that and determine, does the evidence show that they're inspired? And if they are, take a hold of it wholeheartedly. Take, um, take the reproof and the warning and the counsels from the testimonies and let that correction transform us into people who are in love with the truth and love correction and are willing to follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. Thank you for joining me in investigating the testimonies for the church. Shalom.